Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. Alan Reddick here to welcome you to Roots from the Reichenbach, presented jointly by the Reichenbach Irregulars of Switzerland and the Red Circle of Washington. You know, we advertised today's meeting as a worldwide Sherlock Holmes event, and it's turned out to be exactly that. We have representatives online from at least these 15 nations. I hope I didn't miss any countries when I checked the registration list, but if I did, well, you have my apologies and a warm welcome as well. You know, for all the troubles brought on by the pandemic, we've been able to bring Sherlockians together from far and near as never before. And that's a real silver lining, I think. Those of you who are new to Red Circle meetings will be happy to know that as of today, you're all members of the Red Circle. That's because for decades, Peter Blau has decreed that attending just one meeting earns lifetime membership. And speaking of Peter Blau, even though he holds no title in the Red Circle, he's never missed a meeting, and that's not about to change today. Greetings, Peter. Greetings to you all, or as we say in Switzerland, greetings to you all. The grand game is what some Sherlockians and Holmesians call the game some of us play, pretending that the Sherlock Holmes stories are fact, not fiction, and doing our best to explain or explain away the inconsistencies and contradictions found in what we call the canon. It started more than a century ago, codified by Ronald A. Knox, and it's a game that can confuse people who don't know what we're up to. Sherlockian conferences started in 1975 when Ron DeWall arranged a Sherlock Lives conference at Colorado State University. John Bennett Shaw had so much fun there that he went on to hold his first workshop on Sherlock Holmes at Notre Dame in the summer of 1977. Now, some of the best conferences since then have been held in Switzerland. And it's easy to see how much fun people had at them in a new book just published by the Reichenbach Regulars of Switzerland. It's called Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, and Switzerland, Serious and Less Serious Musings. One of its features is an examination of the three possible routes Sherlock Holmes might have taken from the Reichenbach to Florence, and that's what we will examine today. It's a delightful book, and not just because I wrote the introduction, and Marcus Geiser is one of its editors and the founding president of the Reichenbach Irregulars, and in his spare time, a delegate to the International Committee of the Red Cross, will be happy to tell us all about it. Marcus? Well, first of all, Peter, thank you so much for your most flattering words. I mean, it's difficult to follow that act, yes, and that you that you compare our adventures in Alpine Heights, those conferences, and you, of course, attended one, you compare them with the one that Ron DeVol organized all those years ago. I think, thank you so much, yes. Here we go, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, Switzerland. Serious and less serious musings from the Reichenbach Irregulars. It's the first book that we have ever produced. We have been around for about 30 years. And what you will find in this book is a series of papers, of conferences that we produce over the past 10 years or so. It's Stones and Switzerland. It's, of course, the Reichenbach Falls. And you see it here on this slide very clearly. The Reichenbach Irregulars was founded in Meiringen in 1989, yes more than 30 years ago, and the Reichenbach Falls have always been part of our existence, yes. We started off as a very small group, and you see it on your left, yes, having regular meetings in Alpine Heights, always around my ring, and yes, one of our greatest achievements was in 92, a truly transatlantic project that we put together with the bimetallic question of Montreal, Wilfried de Freitas and Patrick Campbell, were the uh, kind of main instigators and my, my proper self as well, yes. And in 92, we unveiled this uh, wonderful plaque at the place where it really happened. And that's, that, of course, is the picture right in the middle on this slide. Uh, and since the 2000s, uh, we stopped producing our journals. We used to have the Reichenbach Journal, the Young Swiss Messenger. We just started to organize conferences, yes. We first found it was, was a little bit more fun. And also in order to attract an international audience, uh, we, we decided to do everything in English. And what happened actually in 2014, we started the first conference, Arthur Conan Doyle in Switzerland, in Davos, where Doyle actually spent uh, several, almost several years, all in all, yes. 
We then had a very successful couple of conferences in 2017 and 2019 in Hasliberg, yes, which is a wonderful location just about Meiring, giving superb views uh, over, uh, over Meiring and the Reichenbach Falls. And then the last one was in 2019 in Hasliberg, and then we moved on to the Splügen Pass. And of course, I don't have to tell you what it all means, the Splügen Pass, the illustrious client. And honestly, if I'm proud of two things in my Sherlock Holmes career, is the Reichenbach plaque that we did together with the bimetallic question. And in these, this conference at the Splügen Pass, taking a group of 30 or 40 Sherlockians from all over the world to the Splügen Pass. And I think it's this, I would say, unique combination of of intellectual curiosity, playing the game the way Peter explained it, and all these in Alpine Heights in superb locations, but affordable, if I may say so, because Switzerland is expensive, but it can be made very affordable. It really makes those conferences what they are. And of course, the introduction to our new book is by our own Peter Blau. I was so happy that Peter joined us in 2014 for the Davos conference. And yes, I'm very proud also to say that uh, I took Beth and Peter and also my own wife, Helen Dory, all the way to Reichenbach and they've had a wonderful time, yes. And the publication that we are going to talk about today is indeed based on all those conferences that I briefly explained. You will find a selection of Sherlockian content, yes, the roots from Reichenbach, you will find a wonderful article about potential connections that Sherlock Holmes might have had, for example, with a famous Swiss girl, yes. And the second part of the book is mainly Doylean. It's about Arthur Conan Doyle's trips and various days in Switzerland. It is also about what he actually wrote when he lived in Switzerland, uh, the characters that he, uh, and the books that he created after he had got rid of, or thought he had got rid of, of Sherlock Holmes at the falls of Reichenbach. And we have the, uh, our delightful friends from Japan, Akane Higayashami and Michu Durashi, who some of you know very well, I know, who have written the afterword to this publication. Uh, it is available through the uh, uh, normal, uh, normal channels, yes, from Amazon to Books on Demand, that's the printing house in Germany. And uh, you can always get in touch with us if you have any problems in getting our book. So once again, thank you so much to the team of the Red Circle to have kindly accepted to organize this joint event, but in particular, thanks to Peter Blau and Ellen Retting. In particular, Ellen, he spent a lot of time putting all this together. Ellen, over to you to continue with the roots from Reichenbach. Well, Marcus, aren't you nice? It's a pleasure to be with you today as we take a virtual hike through the Alps with three people who are very familiar with both the terrain and the canon. It's incredible that just a few days ago, I got an email from the Schatzalp Hotel in Davos asking us to come back and visit again. The Schatzalp, as you just pointed out, was the location of your 2014 meeting. And my wife, Terry, and I were happy to be with you then as we were at the 2017 conference overlooking the falls themselves when our guests today first gave their papers. So let's get right to it. The first of our roots from the Reichenbach will be presented by Eva Iglen. Eva hails from Sweden originally, but has lived in Switzerland for more than 25 years. She joins us today from her home in Stamstadt. A Sherlock Holmes enthusiast since childhood, Eva joined the Sherlock Holmes Society of London in her school days. Her research into the mountain guide who assisted Sherlock Holmes in his trek from the Reichenbach suggests some intriguing aspects of Holmes' alpine experiences. Eva, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I moved to Switzerland in 1989, and after that, it dawned on me that Holmes could not have crossed the Alps on his own. And I started to wonder how he got from Meiringen to Florence. I think that Holmes went to Meiringen as part of a plan, not just by coincidence. Once in Meiringen, it would not be easy for anyone wanting to catch him to know which way he had left. There are many old trading tracks still existing. In 2017, one of my sons gave me the book, Melchior Anderegg, Pionier und Gentleman der Alpen. As I read it, all the pieces suddenly fell into place. 
Melchior Anderegg was the most famous mountain guide in Switzerland in those days. Many of his clients returned year after year, for 20 or 25 years, and he was booked for two to three years in advance. Most of his clients were British and were founding members of the Alpine Club in London. To the left is Melchior Andreg, and on the right is Leslie Stephen, a regular client and friend who was an influential journalist. I'm sure Mycroft would have known Stephen. Melchior was in London on the invitation of Leslie Stephen and the Alpine Club in 1861 and in 1888. On one of these occasions, Stephen and Mycroft might have introduced Holmes and Melchior to each other. Melchior was the first guide in Switzerland to do winter climbs, so he was used to snowy conditions. The beginning of May is too early for the normal climbing season to have started, so chances are big that Melchior was at home on his farm and available at just a moment's notice. He lived in Saal, just to the southwest of Meiringen and about 400 meters higher up. I think Holmes left for Saal as soon as Watson had given up looking for him. By staying much closer to the river, than the normal path from Meiringen to the falls, he could have made his way down to the edge of Meiringen before it got dark. He would have to part walk, part slide down, keeping just on the edge of the woods. This way, he would not be easy to see. On the outskirts of Meiringen, there is a small road one can follow and then turn left up the mountain to get to sound. Holmes would have knocked at Melchior's house. And after introductions, either by a letter or personal knowledge, been put up for the night. Melchior would have enough equipment for both of them. And next day, they would have left Sam. The route Melchior would choose would be the one he had walked several times each year. They would have walked from Sam to Kandersteg, bypassing Interlaken, but I'm sure not going into Interlaken because it's much too big and the risk of meeting Moriarty's men there would have been enormous. They would have crossed the Gemi Pass, continued from Leukebad to Fis, and then turned south into the valley leading to Zermatt. They would walk. Any kind of transportation would increase the risk of being noticed. This is the Matterhorn. And at the base of the Matterhorn is Zermatt. The Theodor Pass is just on the other side of Zermatt, between Matterhorn and Breithorn. Melchior had been climbing in this area for over 30 years and knew the area very well. Guy Marriott found out he even had a souvenir shop in Zermatt. From Zermatt, Melchior would take homes up to the east of Matterhorn, that's left of the mountain on this picture, and cross the Theodule Pass into Italy. I think Melchior accompanied Holmes, at least to Cervinia, the first village after the pass, maybe even to Chassillon. From there, he would have been able to travel by public transport to Florence using one of the disguises he so masterly adopted. As long as Holmes and Melchior were together, Melchior would be the one to arrange where they slept and where they ate. Holmes staying very unobtrusively in the background. And if they were seen, well, Melchior had been traveling for years with a tall, thin client, Leslie Stephen. Remember, there were not a lot of photos around in those days, just a description. Payment would have been arranged by Mycroft probably by sending money by one or two of the members of the Alpine Club coming to do their normal summer climb with Melchior. It is recorded that Melchior bought an additional piece of land in Saal in 1892. Melchior could be relied upon to keep quiet about the whole thing. He was well known for his discretion. And on Sunday, 25th of August, of October in 1891, he would have been reminded about how dangerous Moriarty's men were. A catastrophic fire burned out big
big parts of my ring. The fire started in the house of Mrs. Bregger because of a defect fireplace. There was a strong wind and the fire spread rapidly. Mrs. Bragger rented out rooms to foreigners and the big newspapers in Zurich and Bern reported she had Italians staying. I think Moriarty's men realized that someone must have helped Holmes to get away. And since they could not find that person, they decided to take to revenge on all of my women. I am convinced this is how Holmes got out of Switzerland. And um, just to be sure, I decided to do parts of it myself. I actually climbed up to the ledge where I thought, he, where I think he was lying. And I slid and walked down along the river. And I went up to Saan. I crossed, I crossed the Gemi Pass and I have walked almost all the way. Not, I walked halfway up the valley to Zermatt. And I have walked up and I have crossed Theodor Gletscher with a guide, I must say. It's an easy glacier as far as glacier goes, but still I had a guide. And I'm sure this is the way they did it. Well done, Eva. Thank you for presenting our route number one, along with your personal adventure, which was remarkable. Guy Marriott is up next. He's with us today from just outside London to present route number two. Guy has served as both chairman and president of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London and is invested in the Baker Street Irregulars as the Grand Hotel du Louvre. Guy's non-Sherlockian interests include the history and preservation of all types of passenger transport. He's a patron of the London Transport Museum and a vice president of the London Bus Museum. He's traveled extensively from Alpine passes to remote islands. So it's a warm welcome to Guy Marriott. Thank you, Alan. I'm privileged to be able to speak with you all at the Red Circle this evening and to say something about uh, uh, the route by which Sherlock Holmes got from the Reichenbach Falls to Italy and Florence. Uh, I'm a long time Sherlockian and I've always been fascinated by the great game, the efforts to regard the stories as real and find the ways in which uh, Conan Doyle has adapted real events and geography uh, to the purpose of the stories. I'm a great fan of Switzerland too. I've lived there for some time and I'm very familiar with both the country and the railways of the country and in particular its topography because if we look at the topography of Switzerland it is that you can see a, a panorama of the Bernese Alps, some of the highest mountains in the Alps in German called the Bernese Oberland, but in English we call them sometimes the Bernese Alps. You see in the center the Lake of Briennes, and Meiringen is a little up and left from the Lake of Briennes. And the Reichenbach Falls are opposite Meiringen on the right. Now, when we look at a map of Switzerland, we have to remember that the opportunity for traveling north, south, east, or west from any direction is significantly circumscribed by the topography, by the mountains and by the passes uh, over the mountains. Here we see uh, Meiringen on a map. We see the Reichenbach Falls opposite to Meiringen. And in my uh, analysis of the situation, I'm quite certain that the way in which Holmes was able to uh, escape from uh, Professor Moriarty as a team and on to uh, Italy was by the assistance of a mountain guide. The mountain guide, uh, a man called Melchior Andereg, uh, lived in Zaun, which you see uh, just to the left of the screen there. Having escaped from the falls, as we know, uh, Sherlock Holmes went to Zaun, in my view, to find Melchior Andereg and to obtain from Andreg some of the supplies and uh, assistance that was required. Holmes, you remember, has left the Englischer Hof in Meiringen uh, with Watson for a day trip to the Reichenbach Falls. He was not carrying what was required for a mountainous journey over a, a period of a distance of 30 miles, uh, as part of it at night, uh, to reach the railway at Bussen, because over the Susten Pass, 
you will reach firstly the village of Gadman and then across the pass and further to the right we will then see the town or the village of Bossen. In Bossen we have the railway, the Gotthard Railway, through the Gotthard Tunnel opened in 1882 and Bossen, the nearest station on the Gotthard Railway to Meiringen, is the way that you would sensibly try and get to Italy as quickly and as conveniently as possible. So Holmes, I think, needed assistance to get to Bossen. You can see the mark uh, on the right, you can see marked on the map, uh, the line of the railway, which we go further south, we will find leads us to Milan. And in Milan, you can then get uh, a number of daily trains uh, to Florence, which as we know, was the destination that Holmes reports he reached. So we have to get uh, Holmes from Meiringen, from the falls, across the Susten Pass to Bossen, remembering that he had uh, no equipment with him, but I think he had the services of a guide, Melchior Anderegg. If you remember the story of uh, uh, the final problem, uh, Holmes and Watson on their charming week, wandering up the valley of the River Rhone uh, and crossing the Gemi Pass. Here you see Sidney Paget drawing of the Gemi Pass with Holmes and Watson and a third person, the guide. Uh, the guide is perhaps not generally thought of as necessary to cross the Gemi Pass and the Dalbansee, the lake, the remote lake at the top of the pass. And members of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London in Victorian costume have crossed the pass without uh, any particular difficulty. So we ask ourselves, why is the guide present when you don't really need a guide to cross the Gemi Pass and go along the Dalbansee? Uh, well, I think perhaps the answer is that Holmes and Watson met by chance the guide Melchior Anderegg, who was also going to Meiringen via this route, and the three of them uh, got together and walked together uh, over the pass to find their way down to Meiringen. Not technically difficult, but that is why they have, that is why the uh, image shown by Paget has a guide in it. If we look at the next slide, we will see this is the commencement of the Susten Pass that we saw on the map a little earlier. This is the village of Gadman, where I suggest Holmes was uh, staying briefly after he had gone from the falls with Melchior Anderegg uh, to reach uh, the, the village that he describes as being uh, eight miles from the falls, eight or ten miles from the falls. And here, further along the Susten Road, you see the pass in summer, and then you see the pass in winter. In winter, it looks rather bleak and desolate. We must remember at the end of May, when the story takes place, uh, the, the snow would be still on the ground, but the path through the Susten Pass before the road was constructed uh, was one of several mule tracks, and an experienced man who knew the way would have no difficulty in finding his way through the snow, to, provided he had the appropriate equipment to do so. Um, here we are reminded that Anderegg, Melchior Anderegg, is still remembered today in Meiringen uh, as one of the most famous guides of, of the period, late Victorian period. This is the statue recently unveiled in Conan Doyle Square in Meiringen. Uh, the building behind with the balconies that you can see is the Englischer Hof, the hotel where Holmes and Watson had stayed. The image of Melchior Anderag is the, the top uh, man on this, uh, on, in the statue, and he is roped to the English alpinist Sir Leslie Stephen. Uh, Melchior Anderag was very, a uh, very popular guide and was well retained by the prominent Englishman who came to climb in the Alps in summer. I suggest that Holmes coming down from the falls made his way to Milkio Anderegg's house in Zaun. This is a typical house in Zaun, substantial, warm in winter, sloping roofs where the snow would fall off in winter. And uh, I can't claim that this is Milkio Anderegg's house, but it's similar to what he would have lived in. Having reached Milkio Anderegg, 
Holmes then needed to be supplied with food and drink. He needed some bandages for the, uh, the scratches, the, the wounds that he had suffered coming down uh, from the ledge where he had hidden. And Melchior Andereg would supply uh, illumination. There's a lantern, uh, a proper alpenstock. Remember, Holmes had left his alpenstock behind at the falls for Watson to discover the note and some rope. Now, and presumably also some other clothing, some warm clothing. Continuing then across the pass, you will reach Vossen. Here is the village of Vossen in summer. It looks very nice, very pleasant. The Gotthard passes further uh, up the valley that you see, but the railway went under the pass. The railway went through the Gotthard tunnel. And here, a train, steam locomotive, carriages, emerging from the Goddard Tunnel. Again, I can't claim that Holmes was on that train, but he would have been on something very similar uh, to have reached Milan quickly, easily and conveniently to thereafter catch a train to Florence. I'm very pleased to say that uh, on exactly the same data, of course, uh, Ava uh, Igland and Brian Stone have reached other conclusions, but if we all reached the same conclusion, there'd be no fun in the great game. I'm happy and proud to present my own theory. And uh, if you want to read more about it, of course, you will have to get the book that we are promoting here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. It's fascinating that both you and Eva begin the journey with Holmes setting off for Zahn to enlist the services of Milky or Anderegg. But from there, the travels go in very different directions. Well, let's see what happens with our third route to be offered by Brian Stone. Brian is originally from the UK, but has lived in Switzerland since 1969 and has long been a Swiss citizen. Today, we find him at home in Ettingen near Basel. Brian's career was in the international railway business, and today he writes on both railway history and the history of the Anglican Church. His knowledge of period travel is impressive, and he works closely with his wife, Joanna, who has published several Sherlock Holmes stories in German, four of which are also available in English, with more to come. So, Brian, the floor is yours for route number three. Thank you, Alan, for the invitation and all of you. I look forward to a most enjoyable evening with you all. And now, where are we going to go next? Holmes is a thinker and his thoughts condition his actions. My paper describes his thoughts as he lies above the Reichenbach Falls and then his actions, and the cannon is our guide. He has survived. He didn't expect the confrontation. He's unprepared. He's even surprised to be alive. Now he's thinking again. So let me ask you to think with me what it was like at that moment. He's dirty, disheveled, injured and bleeding. He's hungry and it's evening. Snow lies on the ground. He must escape Moran. He's killed Moriarty. Good, but that means he's a fugitive from justice. And now he can't risk discovery and arrest. He cannot go back to Myringen. He must flee. But his clothes, his baggage, his papers and his money are all in the hotel. They are lost to him. And he must survive the night. That's elementary, but survival alone is not enough. He must plan the future. He decides to disappear and let the world think him dead. He knows that the path climbs further to Rosenlaui and through the snow over the pass to Grindelwald. He knows that Grindelwald is just 10 miles over the mountain. Is that the answer? This is the Reichenbach Falls and the path goes uphill steadily past Rosenlaui, which in the win winter is closed by the way, uh, and up to what he shows the Grosse Scheidegg, a German name, but that doesn't have to trouble you. 6,300 feet, not too high, but certainly in snow. And then a descent on the other side to Grindelwald, which is quite a, thorough, a, a thriving thoroughfare. Holmes at this stage knows nothing of Florence or of any other mission. He must find his new identity. And for that, he must reach Brother Mycroft, who is in London. How can he do that? 
Well, he knows that Bern, the Swiss capital, has a British embassy, and they could reach Mycroft. If he can make it to Grindelwald, he can get to Interlaken, and then Bern is near. So the next map shows you what he's got to do. From Grindelwald, we've marked the railway down to Interlaken, which was new. And in Interlaken, there is then the traditional way along the lakes and through the valley of the Ahr to Bern. It isn't far. And if he can get help in Interlaken, he'll be safe and home in Bern. And when he does that, he can ride and not walk. So now to reach Mycroft is his aim. Deductions told him how to achieve it. He must go to Bern. He decides that he will take the risk and he walks up the path and finds a place to rest and a friendly cowman. And after 10 miles over the mountain, he succeeds, as we all know. But just remember, as a fugitive, disreputable, almost penniless, he cannot know where it will all lead. But with Mycroft's help, he can become a new man, clean, rested, well-dressed, with papers and money to live a new identity. And only then can he know what is in store. This map shows that there is a direct railway line from Bern to Luzern, and there were several express trains daily. The morning express from Bern connects in Luzern with a Gotthard Express coming from Germany, which will take homes directly to Milano. And that is over the classic Gotthard route through the tunnel and over into the northern part of Italy. In Milano, he has the opportunity to take one of the three trains a day which go to Florence directly. That is not a problem, he would normally just board it and go to Milan, uh, go to Milano, and from there he was home. Now let's look at the pictures of the route. Symbolically, this of course is the fall as it stands there in the woods even today. You can see it like this at any moment. Now let's go to the next one. But this is the fall seen from the opposite side of the valley on the Hasleyberg. And as you see, it's still a very dramatic fall, particularly after heavy rain, which, which is when this picture was taken. And above it is the restaurant Zwiergi, which is in a way a turning point for the decision to go up or down. This little hut, it looks enchanting, doesn't it? This little hut has been modernized. Look at that roof, for example. But it is in fact a 200 year old cowman's hut on the Alp above Twiergi. And this is where I postulate that Holmes finds a, be a bed of hay, some cheese and some bread with a friendly cowman. It's not far above there that this scene was taken where the path leads along the side of the Reichen River. Above it you can see the Rosenlaue Glacier and you can also see that it is a walking path, it's not mountaineering. A little further upstream, we come to the Rosenlaue Hotel. Now, Conan Doyle missed something here because the Rosenlaue Hotel never opened until the second half of May. So they were not going to spend the night there. But it is a beautiful setting and it looks just the same today. And this photograph was taken a few meters further up the hill. This one is important too, because on the extreme left of the picture, you see the ridge, which is the Grosse Scheidegg at 6,300 feet. From there, as you see, over the edge, and then a steady walk down into Grindelwald, which is in the bottom of the valley. The big mountain behind is the Wetterhorn, and Grindelwald sits at the bottom. Now, when he got there, he found a new railway. It was a steam railway, and in winter, they ran two trains a day down to Interlaken. This, of course, was taken a lot later, but even so, it was 50 years ago. And the hotel in the background was certainly there when Holmes was there. When he gets to, to Interlaken, he has to say, how do I now get to Bern? And the note on the station, there was always a board telling you where all the places of interest were, 
gave him the address of the church warden of the Anglican church, which is in fact uh, embedded in the old monastery of Interlaken. And this is what it looks like. And there, in all confidence, he found friendly help and a chance to clean up and rest, and contact was made with the embassy. And with that, he was home and dry. So there you are. You see that by thinking and acting, by deduction and not guesswork, Holmes turns near disaster into opportunity. But then you never thought otherwise. Thank you for your interest. And now let's have a great evening. Brian, I second that motion. A great evening it is with more to come. Thanks so much. Now, I thought that before we get into a discussion that will include your questions, it might be a good idea to take another look at the maps, this time with all three routes superimposed so we can see how they relate to each other. Of course, all roads lead from the falls, and we can see that both Eva's green route and Guy's orange route go first to Zon in order to enlist the services of the guide Melchior Anderek. From Zon, Eva's route continues west toward Interlaken, while Guy's doubles back past the falls and sets off eastward. Meanwhile, Brian's blue route is also bound for Interlaken, but by a more southerly course that takes Holmes first to Grindenwald, then by train up to Interlaken. Guy's easterly route takes Holmes first to Gadman, and then let's look at a wider map to see where he goes from there. Here you see that at Gadman, Guy's orange route continues east to Vossen, where Guy postulates that Holmes boarded a southbound train. Meanwhile, back in Interlaken to the west, Eva's and Brian's green and blue journeys have converged, but now will take very different directions. Eva has Holmes heading south with Andereg, while Brian sends him northwest to Bern, where he can enlist the help of Mycroft from the embassy there. That accomplished, Brian sends Holmes by rail to Lucerne and then to Vassen, where his route joins Guy's. Both Brian and Guy say that the train carries Holmes across the Italian border to Milan, where connecting trains to Florence were plentiful. Further to the west, Eva has Holmes and Andereg on foot to Zermatt and across the border south of the Matterhorn, where she postulates that a network of local trains took Holmes to Florence. And there we are. Three distinctly different routes from the Reichenbach, brilliantly researched and presented by friends who know whereof they speak. It is discussion time, and before we get into that, I must tell you that, uh, although it may have seemed different, Guy was unable to be with us today, so we pre-taped his presentation. Uh, Marcus Geiser has uh, uh, volunteered to answer any questions that you may have for Guy, but Eva and Brian are here with us today, and uh, we'll be glad to answer your questions as well. So I thought I would begin the, the questions in a, in a way by, by just asking about I guess you'd call it time and space. Um, you know, in in the, in the empty house, Holmes said it took him a week to get from the falls to Florence. And given the routes that we've just seen, it just seems that that was a long time because it seems as though by use of, at least in part, railroads and so forth, um, people, uh, people, Holmes could have made it there a lot quicker than one week. And I want to talk about the timetable a little bit and beginning maybe with Eva. Eva, since you, <laughs> since you walked it or most of it, uh, what do you think about that? The, the timing that it would take, would it have taken him a week to get all that, uh, that distance or not? If you could just go ahead and turn on your microphone, Eva, and, and tell us about that. Yeah, um, I do think it would take about a week because just the walking from sound and then past to up to Kandersteg, across the Gemi Pass, and all the way up to Zermatt would take at least three days. Um, and then there's another day at least, if you hurry, across up from Zermatt and up across the Theodul Pass and down to Slovenia. Uh, I and took longer than that to walk that way. But then I wasn't in a hurry. I wanted to see other things. I didn't have a, I didn't have a guide for most of the route. I did for the, for the glacier, but not for most of the route. And I am convinced that once they would leave at least five days to get down to Shervenia or 
Chassillon. And from there, it's another two days to get to Florence, which with local trains and maybe not wonderful connections, I think they would need that. So I think the timetable for a week would be okay, but you'd have to hurry, you'd have to walk fast. But then they both knew that if they were caught, they would be very severely treated by Moriarty's men. And Melchior knew that because he was helping Holmes, he would receive the same treatment. So they, they were bound to hurry. Very good. Marcus, what do you think about that same question? And well, of course, I, I try to uh, represent Guy here, which is very difficult, yes, but we discussed it before, yes. Not this particular answer to that particular question, because I didn't know it would be asked, yes. But I think, I think what, what Guy shows uh, is it, probably the fastest route, yes, uh, because I think time is of essence, yes. I, I think Guy is right by making his assumption that get the hell out of there and then get yourself on a train down south is really what is what is of essence. I, I, I agree with him that uh, if you think of Italy at the late 19th century, it was not a country in chaos, but a country where it actually was fairly easy for him to hide, yes. Uh, uh, let's not forget he spoke some Italian. You, you will notice, of course, from the final problem, I don't have to tell you that because he convinced even Dr. Watson, he could speak some Italian, yes. So I, 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 I think those 10 days, I think he may have not spent 10 days, uh, sorry, a week in, uh, in, in the mountains. Uh, he may have actually uh, uh, spent a bit of time in Italy, yes, uh, into, into Florence, yes. And our friend Enrico Solito from the Uno Stadio uh, in, 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 in Italy, yes, who also actually contributed to our book, he, he, he brings in some interesting ideas about uh, the, the chaotic situation of Florence when actually Holmes arrived in May 1891. And it's exactly what he actually needed also in order to, to be not, to be not uh, found by Moriarty, yes. Okay, and uh, just to round things up, Brian, you're the railroad man. Uh, what do you think about this timetable question? I found that the seven days fitted perfectly with the um, solution I'd offered. Uh, it's clear that he had to get out quickly, as we've heard said just now. He had to sleep. It was evening and it was snowy and he had to stop somewhere and rest. And that was in the hut. The benefit there was that a, a cowman in a lonely hut above Twig would not have had the news from uh, Myring. And in the meantime, that there was a hue and cry going on down in the valley. The next morning he sets off. And remember, it is only 10 miles over the mountain from the falls to Grindelwald village. Uh, and that is not too long to walk. He could be there by lunchtime on the following day. He takes the afternoon train down to Interlaken. It costs three francs 50, and he, I'm assuming that he had that much ready cash in his pocket. And then from Interlaken, he was able to sleep, wash, and tidy up and make contact with the embassy. Now, they said, come next morning quickly. And they contacted Mycroft and got uh, instructions. Now, we needed three days at the embassy because Mycroft was going to prepare a new identity. He was going to prepare a, a mission for Holmes. Remember, he didn't know up to this point whether he was going to Florence or anywhere else. He had to be told where to go and what to do when he got there. That was all prepared for him. And this information would come principally in the diplomatic bag with a courier. That takes two days. So. It was essentially then on the last day but one that he took the early morning train to Lucerne and got on to the Gotthard Express that put him into Milan in the evening and the next morning on the seventh day he was in Florence and he had in fact walked 10 miles over the mountain. Well since you're since we're talking about it Brian let's come back to you and ask ask this question. Um, would there have been any particular danger to Holmes on the trains? Would he have stood out? Would, it, would he have been kind of the sore thumb that was noticed and with Moriarty's men and so forth? Uh, not at this stage, because um, remember, he had watched and cleaned up in Interlaken and had a good night's sleep. The hue and cry were not raised in Grindelwald and, and Interlaken. It was the Journal de Genève of the 6th of May which um, brought the news into the public. But by the 6th of May, Holmes was in the embassy in Bern in the early morning. 
So he wouldn't have been too much of a problem there. Riding down from Grindelwald to Interlaken on the local train was, on, was certainly the most vulnerable bit because a scruffy Englishman was a very unusual feature in Switzerland of those days. And he was scruffy, he was torn, injured and so on. But um, once he was through the mill of the embassy in Bern, he was a new man, he could buy clothes, he would even have bought a dinner jacket and trousers uh, <laughs> because uh, every Englishman traveled with an evening suit for dinner in those days. He would have had baggage and he would have been provided with letters of credit and money from the government in London via the embassy in Bern. With that, as a new man, he was a completely anonymous first class traveler. And I suppose it also follows that he wouldn't have any trouble with formalities in terms of the border. I guess passports and visas were no issue. <clears throat> there were very few formalities in those days. It was extremely unusual to be checked uh, personally. What was checked very often was uh, at customs, your baggage. But his baggage was harmless. It was the baggage of a traveling Englishman. Yeah, yeah. That was it. That's good. Um, there are some questions coming in on chat, and I'll just do ask those, these fine folks to open their microphones and ask them. And if I get the name right, Priya, Priya Musu had something about uh, where he was going in the first place. Are you there? Hello, Priya. Well, okay, I will ask that question in, 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 instead. Uh, the question is, and, and Brian, you sort of answered this in some respects because because uh, Mycroft told him to go to Florence. But the question probably then for Eva and uh, and maybe for Marcus, why did Holmes head to Italy in the first place? Why in particular Italy? Why didn't he go somewhere else? Eva, an idea for that? No, but he had to go somewhere. So in my book, it might just as well have stood I walked, at, I walked and a week later I find myself in Munich or whatever. I think Milan, Italy was pr probably coincidence. Unless Mycroft had told him from the beginning because of the situation in, in Florence, which Enrico has told about, it would be good if he could get there. But uh, in my opinion, it was more of a coincidence that he got to Italy. He just had to get somewhere, I guess. That's yeah, he just had yeah. to get out of Switzerland. Yeah. yeah. Marcus, anything to add on if, that on uh, behalf if, of Guy? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I actually uh, slightly disagree with Eva, and I, I continue Brian's uh, uh, thread of thought about Holmes being a very rational character, yes. And, and indeed, if you actually read Enrico Solito's paper, which is in our book, which is based on research that uh, our Italian friends have, have made and undertaken over the past few years. It very convincingly shows that uh, if you don't go into the empty house, you know, those various destinations, Khartoum and Tibet, and even Florence, they were very much on top of the mind of, of British foreign policy interests at that time, yes. And we know, I think, the connection between Mycroft Holmes and Sherlock Holmes in the final problem in the empty house, I think that's not being disputed, yes. And what Enrico actually unearthed in his paper, based on some research that, that some of his friends did, actually is an interesting one. Um, uh, there were uh, original manuscripts of, of travelers, of, of, of Italian Jesuit priests, I think, who traveled to Tibet in the late 17th century, if I get it right. Uh, and those documents, I mean, we're talking about the real documents here, because anyway, we're talking about the real world, as we, as we, as we always do when we have our Sherlock in events, of course. Um, uh, can actually be a, a show, should he actually show that these documents were, were had just been discovered in some private collections in Florence, and Holmes could have very easily actually consulted them. They would have been very useful for his trips that uh, uh, that uh, to Tibet. Yes, again, if you if you agree that it was not just a mindless trip to go to Tibet, but it was something much more uh, important. Yes. Uh, than just uh, uh, running around and running away from Moriarty. Yes. So I think there were some good reasons why he went to, to, to Florence, yes. Uh, I would say yes. In that case, I agree with what Enrico says. And his colleagues, I mean, he really bases himself on research that he has done over years with, with, Italian friend, with his Italian friends. 
lots of good information. Thank you, Marcus. Um, a few other things I wanted to mention. Uh, one of them is thank you all so much for your kind comments in chat. I mean, it has just been lovely. And as you see, Marcus, I'm sure people are ordering the book already. So, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're a hit and it's, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> I would uh, also mention just really quickly. Indeed, like thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there'll be more too before it's done. Um, I just wanted to read, uh, he doesn't have to come on, but I wanted to read David Leal's comment about the customs. He said, interesting point about customs, Woodhouse books include some customs, minor smuggling plot points, but I can't recall ever reading a mention of passports or visas. Bertie just seems to get on a boat and go. <laughs> so I think that may very well be true in, in much of Europe in those days. Uh, I'm going to say this. Uh, that kind of you had many, many wonderful comments, and very few, you know, questions. The floor is still open for questions, but we're going to proceed mm -hmm. to we're going to proceed to other things at the moment. And Hello. the first and the first other thing we're going to uh, proceed to is I'm going to ask you a question, just a one question. It's not a quiz. It's sort of a poll as much as anything else. But on your screen now is appearing your choice. If you were Holmes, which route would you most likely take? And I would love it if each of you would click one of those bubbles and push submit. And we'll we'll see what what route you like the best. And let's Brian go. had a question, I think. Why not give Brian a chance to give a comment? Yes, as everyone all right, we can do that, Brian, while yeah. we're, while the rest of the people are... I mean, are, Brian, you wanted to say something, I think. Yes, it was on the question of passports. Oh, go if ahead. You, if you look back at um, the guidebooks, Baedeker, for example, um, you find that uh, it's usually advised that pa travellers should have a passport, although it will seldom be required. But it, it's very necessary that they should be able to identify themselves with proper documents if there is any kind of snag problem incident in which they need to identify themselves. So passports are not basically an issue. And crossing borders is very seldom referred to in a matter, as a matter of immigration or um, um, uh, producing passports. Customs, on the other hand, are described in many places as being a considerable nuisance. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they are. Well, let's see. The polls are uh, seem to be stalled, even though there are about 20 of you out there who haven't haven't uh, voted yet. But the results are interesting. I think what we'll do is we'll we'll end this. Uh, and almost 100 of you have voted, I will show you how the results have been. Uh, there we have uh, the green route, which is shown in orange, which is a little bit confusing. The green route 30 41%. That's Eva. The orange route, that's guy 25%. And uh, Brian, your blue route is 34%. So there's a fairly even, uh, a fairly even fall of the cards, as we say. And uh, that's kind of nice to see. So the 41% uh, for green, 25% for orange, and 34% for blue. The grand game is the big winner in all of this, I think. And uh, we can just call it that and, and say that that's wonderful. Well, we'll take that off the screen. And thank you very much for that. Uh, next comes, and, we, and every red circle meeting has to come to this, the, ne the next I order of business is going to be our uh, diabolical quiz. And the uh, theme of our quiz today is second first class. And I only can imagine what second first class means. We certainly all know the quotation, the second first class carriage from the front will be reserved for us. But I think we need more explanation than that. And I would call upon our friend and Red Circle quiz master extraordinaire, Dana Richards, to open your microphone, join us and explain yourself, sir. What all does... right, am I on? You're right. on, you're Good. on. Well, um... First, I just want to mention that I actually have on the wall behind me the uh, Sherlock Holmes Sport Hotel from Meyerongen. Uh, I, I, I got that off of the side of one of their vans. And uh, so I, I, I hope they're, they got another one to replace it. In any event, um, the idea behind the quiz is simple enough. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to take the first cab or the second cab, but you need the third cab. And Holmes didn't take the first 
uh, first class. He took the second first class. And so the idea here is that uh, I'm going to ask you a question and, uh, and you have to give me a first answer, but which I, what I really want is your second answer. So everything will have two, two answers. And so you need uh, to give me two, but the first one will get you one point, but the second one will get you three points, two points, I'm sorry, for a total of three points. So, uh, so you, get a, you get a bonus for, this, for the second one. And, and we'll proceed in that fashion. Okay, okay. okay. so, so for yourself and, and then we'll be off. Okay, so let me review. 10 questions, two answers to each question. If you get one answer right to each question, you get one point. If you get both answers right, you get two points for the second answer for a total of three for that question. Have I got it right? Right, yeah, okay. don't, don't settle for the first, you have to go for the second. Okay, So All you right. have second first. Second first. Let's move on to question one. All right. What are the two French cities mentioned? A lot of cities are mentioned. I think only two of them were French. Okay. And just to be clear, we're talking about final problem here. Now. Final problem. Let me say, I, I was asked to give a quiz on the final problem. Right. It's a little right. odd because most of the action in today's discussions took place in the empty house or were described in the empty house. But um, I was asked to give a quiz on the final problem. Oh, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify that too. So okay. That people know that we're talking about what are the two French cities mentioned in the final problem? All right. Where were there two condensed accounts? There were two condensed accounts of the, that were reported in the final problem. Moving right along. What are the two eateries, restaurants, if you like, mentioned? What could they be? There are two mentioned quite explicitly. Restaurants. Moving right along. What are the two mentions of Mrs. Watson by Holmes? What are the two mentions of cigarettes? Swiss bodies of water mentioned. And they were both mentioned in the presentations just given. They were indeed. Water. All right, on to number seven. What are the two unused weapons of Holmes? Okay. Two weapons. Two weapons that he had but did not use. What are the two indications? that Holmes wanted to be a scientist. Just give him another second or two. That's hard. The, 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 um, what are the two uses of the word proof by Holmes? Oddly enough, not by Moriarty, but by Holmes. Two uses of the word proof. And for number 10, there are special rules, right? Right, for 10, there's actually three possible answers. So if you get all three, you can get one plus two plus three, six points for all three. All right, name two or three ways. Holmes crossed Moriarty. And these are all verbs. I'll bet you some people will get all three. I, 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 you know, I don't know, I have a hunch. I have a hunch. I'm, I'm guessing most of the people here have never read the final problem. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you'd be wrong about that. <laughs> oh, I think I might be wrong about that too. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, those are the 10 questions, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. And uh, I guess, I guess there's nothing for it, but we have to tell them what the answers are. huh? All right. All now right, let's go back to question one. What are the two French cities mentioned? Uh, clearly Paris was mentioned. Strasbourg, uh, spelled 
the wrong way in uh, in the canon. Um, so, where were there two condensed accounts? This was also alluded to. General de Geneve and the Reuters dispatch a day later. The third account, so to speak, was uh, many, many years later. What are the two eateries mentioned? And this one is the buffet at New Haven and the Salle de Manger at Strasbourg. If, anybody find the third one? Okay. Okay. No, I think we're good on that one. All right, okay. What are the two mentions of Mrs. Watson by Holmes? One's at the beginning of the story and the other's at the end of the story. Is Mrs. Watson in? And pray give my greetings to Mrs. Watson in that final letter. Very good, I hope you did well on that. What are the two mentions of cigarettes? Well, in Watson's room, he seemingly needed one desperately for a soothing influence. And of course, he had a silver cigarette case at the end. Yeah, that's the one I think for sure most people got. What are the two Swiss bodies of water mentioned? Uh, the Rhone River and the Dalbinze. Um, there's two thes in this sentence. What are the two... Oh, <laughs> weapons of Holmes. That's my mistake. Sorry about that. A little and, editorial uh, error there. But and anyway. the answer is the revolver in the pocket. That's pretty obvious. And the Alpenstock, uh, I think everybody would agree, was, was a weapon that he could have used and, and apparently chose not to use in some sort of English fair play deference. What are the two indications that Holmes wanted to be a scientist? One quote in the story is he wanted to look into the problems furnished by nature. And the other is he wanted to concentrate my attentions upon chemical researches. These are things that he might have done if he had rid the world of Moriarty. I think those are clearly different and clearly references to being a scientist. What are the two uses of the word proof by Holmes? Again, we have to ask silly questions like these because we need to make sure everybody doesn't have the same score. All right. <laughs> My nerves are fairly proof, Watson. And he says, I have the best of proofs. The blow would fall. Watson was unsure whether uh, he was really in danger. And he says, I have the best of proofs. So those are two different uses of the word proof. And name two or three ways that Holmes crossed Moriarty. And they are, he was incommoded, he was hampered, and he was inconvenienced on would separate all, days. Would you also accept wrestled or struggled on the brink? No, no. The, all right. It is a verb, but it's, it's, it's just clearly not associated with the crossed in quote marks. In, in the quotation. Okay. That's right. Okay, so that gives a po possible total of 33. There is a prize, so please total your score. And uh, Teresa Dudley got 20. Anybody yeah. else get 20 or higher? And Marlo got 18. Stefan, got Stefan why have 19. Yeah. I guess we got our three winners. I think we do. Uh, so congratulations to Teresa, Anne, and Stefan. And what we will do now is declare you the winners. We will end the quiz section here and say thank you so much to Dana. It was, it was good. It was good. <laughs> it was frustrating, but it was good. And, uh, and uh, we have to have prizes for three winners. So uh, I think we'll turn it over to Marcus to talk about prizes. Wow. Yes, uh, first of all, Dana, excellent, yes. Uh, I'm sure you will have more quizzes. It was not your final problem, yes, I, I can assure <laughs> you, yes. It's always great, yes. By the way, great to see you. 
Uh, and uh, yes, the three windows, yes. I mean, each of you just get a copy of our book. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm as simple as that, yes. So uh, I will I make sure that, I re that, that we will get your addresses, etc. I think actually most of your addresses I have, and then we will sort it out and we'll send it to you. So we'll, we'll go from there to final words and the final words first from Marcus. Marcus? Thanks again, again for, for organizing this uh, truly other transatlantic uh, cooperation, yes, in the history of the Reichenbach Irregulars. We've had a, a few of those, yes, and I mentioned the Reichenbach plaque, and of course, Wilfried de Freitas is here. So yes, we do like those transatlantic adventures, yes. As we all know, Sherlock Holmes was a transatlantic traveler in many ways. He mentioned this somewhere in the canon. And uh, thanks to Peter and thanks to Alan really for putting it together, but of course also to our speakers, Eva and Guy and Brian, who have really played brilliantly this wonderful game of, 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 of the grand, the, our grand game, yes. I think we have proven that it is not only Oxford, whether Sherlock Holmes went to Oxford or to Cambridge is one of those questions that will never be fully answered, thankfully, yes, because it gives us all these opportunities to have endless conversations. We have now found another great question, yes. We found it tonight, yes. Which mountain pass may, may he have taken to reach Florence, yes. And uh, of course, also, I mean, uh, this, is, this event is also to promote the book, yes. So thank you to all of you who have an interest uh, uh, who are, those of you, of course, who bought the book, yes, it's, it's fairly easy to, uh, to, to buy, yes. For those who live in Europe, yes, go over the uh, Book on Demand bookshop. And for others uh, who are more familiar, I mean, others who live overseas, yes, Amazon is definitely the best, best way of getting it. I'm being told Amazon Germany has, has, has some good offers, yes. And if you have any questions, any problems, just shoot us an email. Uh, Reichenbach irregulars at gmail.com and I will send I will just put this now into the chat thanks again over to you Alan and Peter okay and Peter Peter one final last word from the red circle and we'll be and we will be gone thank you Alan I want to thank you all for participating for coming uh, special thanks to Alan for making us look so good uh, Alan's only titled as webmaster but he's far more for us than that uh, now, uh, I suggest you all visit our website, redcircledc.org, where you will find an opportunity to order Red Circle pins. Now, uh, Tom Fars kindly provides those. You are all members of the Red Circle having attended a meeting. Uh, if you'd like to prove it, there's the pin. We don't have membership cards. Uh, Tom Fars is on the website, uh, and so is information on how to order the book. Finally, there's one more thing to look at in the calendar. And I like to say that one of the advantages of living in what I call panic on the Potomac is the opportunity to be a member of the Smithsonian Associates. And the Smithsonian Associates have a wonderful range of programs. Uh, it has been even nicer during the pandemic because they're all done via Zoom. And their Zoom presentations will continue into October, on October 6th. Uh, Dan Stashauer, who may still be here, and Scott Sadar, who's a professional actor, will present a program on Sherlock Holmes. And there's information about that in the calendar at our website. Uh, Dan and Scott have done many people uh, from Will Rogers uh, onward, and they do a grand job. Thank you to all. Uh, our next meeting possibly will be sometime in September, possibly not virtual. Stay tuned. We'll let you all know. Fine. Farewell. Thank you, Peter.